Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode number 354, recorded July 6th, 2018. Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Go to ring.com slash triangulation and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security Kit. And by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software helping small business owners thrive. Try it for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we talk to some of the most interesting minds working in technology today. And I am honored to welcome Dr. Virginia Eubanks. She is an activist and a political science professor at the University of Albany in New York. She's worked in community technology and economic justice for two decades. And she's also the author of Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile Police and Punish the Poor. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So two things that stood out for me with this uh, book. One is how you really root it in history. So comparing the uh, the, the poor house of the 1800s um, to to what we do today, to uh, to what our you know government does today, uh, sort of storehousing the information of the poor, um, and also just the fact that you spoke to the people. You didn't just speak to the people making these tools, which you did, or the people using these tools. You spoke to the people that were most greatly affected um, by these tools. And um, I just want to start with a story that you mentioned. Uh, you have many reasons for writing, many inspirations for writing this book, but one of them happened uh, a while ago, like, long, you know, not not very currently. You've been working on this a long time. Uh, you spoke to a woman who was using one of the EBT cards uh, that, you know, were supposed to replace, uh, that, that replace uh, food stamps in many places. And kind of, I had always thought, well, that must be nice. It removes the stigma. And, you know, just, just tell a little bit about a story of, of what you learned from her during that conversation. Yes. Yeah, so the um, woman you're talking about was a young mom on public assistance who goes by a pseudonym in the book because I talked to her many years ago for academic research. Um, and so the, her pseudonym in the book is Dorothy Allen. Um, and I come from a background in the community technology center movement, as well as welfare rights and economic justice. And so I worked for a long time sort of co-creating technical resources with people uh, mostly who lived in either public housing or in low-income neighborhoods. Um, in this case, it was a residential YWCA in my hometown of Troy, New York. And Dorothy had been involved in the creation of this tech lab, and we were just hanging out in the tech lab one day, sort of shooting the breeze about technology. And I asked her, much like you just said, I asked her, oh, like, so what do you feel, how do you feel about your EBT card, your electronic benefits transfer? for a card, um, thinking sort of the same things, that uh, perhaps it was easier, it was more convenient, it was less stigmatizing than actually pulling out um, paper food stamps. And she said, you know, she said, yeah, well, it's those things. Um, but also my caseworker uses it to track all of my payments or all of my purchases and all of my movements. So she would go into her caseworker's office and her caseworker would say things like, um, why are you buying all your groceries at the corner store? If you go to the grocery store, it's much cheaper. And so she knew that her purchases were being sort of looked at by her caseworker. Um, and I must have had this like incredibly shocked, naive look on my face because she kind of pointed and laughed at me for a while. Um, and then she got like more serious and she was like, oh, Virginia, you know, you all, meaning professional middle class folks, you all should pay attention to what's happening to us because they're coming for you next. And um, that was 2000. So that was 18 years ago. And so whenever I'm writing and whenever I'm doing this work on how technology and public services intersect, I really have Dorothy's voice in the back of my head both for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, she was remarkably generous, right? Like that was an incredibly generous thing to say, to say like, oh, well, this is already happening to us, but you should watch out. Um, like it might happen to you as well. Um, but also I think the big lesson there is that 
folks in poor and working class neighborhoods are already living in sort of the digital future, right? There's that old Gibson saw about the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, I actually agree with him, but I think I mean it in the opposite way that he meant it, which is in many um, sort of low income environments like poor and working class neighborhoods, communities of color, um, in un. Um, undocumented migrants, communities of undocumented migrants, right? We're already seeing sort of the future of digital surveillance. And so it just really pays to have folks like Dorothy Allen um, be the people you start these stories with, because not only are they facing sort of the most direct impacts of these systems, um, but also they're, they have the best information and they're the most invested in creating sort of smart solutions to the kinds of problems that, that these tools create. It's almost like what you're saying is Gibson's, uh, you know, unevenly distributed. The dystopian future is more distributed to, uh, to the poor. At yeah, this point. exactly. And and the like the most sophisticated tools go into. It's not just the poor, though. I really think it pays to look in poor working class communities. Um, but uh, any community that you could think of as having sort of a low rights environment, a place where it's not clear that people's basic rights will be respected, that there's not a lot of accountability. Um, so that could be, uh, like I said, communities of color. That could also be in in war zones around the world. Right. That's where you see these really sophisticated tools getting tested. And it makes a lot of sense to start there. I think our conversations about sort of technology, even about technology and social justice, can be maddeningly abstract. We talk about these tools like, you know, the big concerns are the things that are going to happen sometime in the future, right? Is um, an automated driving car, if it's given the choice of hitting a box of puppies or a pedestrian, right? Like, which one will it choose? And not that that's not an important question. It actually really is. Um, but it, it assumes that the harms of these tools are going to happen in the future, that they're not happening now. And um, for the folks I talked to for this book, these are not thought experiments. These are things that are happening in their lives right now. They're having real measurable harms, including killing people. So let's talk, a little, before we uh, talk about the book, um, you have a great piece on your blog about what you mean when you talk about class, which I think can be um, really... Uh, I didn't know anyone had ever read that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Um, because it's really interesting. It's hard. I mean, I've done, when I've talked about stuff like this on the show, sometimes I'll say the poor and people take offense to that. And it's like, you know, people don't really understand. So I guess just define a little bit um, of what you mean when you talk about class. Yeah. So, I, well, one, I love to talk about class and I particularly love to, to talk about my own class identity because um, it's something we don't do enough in the United States because we have this myth that we live in a classless society and it really drives a lot of harm that we don't sort of admit to each other where we're at, like where, where we feel like we belong in terms of our class identity. Um, so I'll, I'll first, I'll just say that I came from a professional middle class um, uh, background, and that's a really important part of my cultural upbringing. Um, but both of my parents were class migrants, which means my mom actually moved from the working class into the professional middle class, and my dad actually went the opposite direction, started in the professional middle class, and because he had some undiagnosed mental illness um, and some addiction issues, um, if he hadn't have had uh, family support towards the end of his life, um, it you know, it's likely he would have been un unhoused. Um, so, and my, by sort of debts and income, currently I would probably consider myself working class because we make, um, my partner and I together make about $42,000 a year, which is below the median household income. Um, though I have a lot of discretion on my job, which is more like being professional middle class than middle class, right? Or, I'm sorry, than working class. So what we what I've just done is like just shine a little bit of a light on like how complicated class identity is and actual class is in the United States because we have a tendency to talk about it as low middle up. Um, and if you give people those three choices, everyone's going to pick middle because nobody wants to be like the snobs at the top, um, but nobody wants to identify with the schlubs at the bottom. And so everybody's going to pick middle. And one of the things that's really interesting is in the United States, if you give people even four choices instead of three, they st if you give people the choice of working class, they start to break down in much more interesting ways. So we talk about class in really stupid ways. That's the the sort of um, the upshot. Um, and the way that I, the, the, the categories that I use um, are um, 
poor and working poor, which I think are actually the same thing. All poor people are working people. Um, Working class, um, which tends to be um, you make a a little bit of a more stable, less precarious income, but you don't have a lot of discretion over what you do at your job day to day. Professional middle class, uh, which uh, I think of as being a bit of above the the median um, income line, um, but it also in, it sort of requires uh, or assumes that you have some kind of wealth, right? That you have um, a home that hasn't put you in catastrophic debt and at the edge of precarity, or um, you, know, you might move into a second home at some point in your life. You might have two really decent incomes in your household. Um, and then uh, I talk about folks who are in the owning class, and the owning class just means that you have enough wealth that you don't have to work to live. You can live off your investments. Um, lots of folks who have that much wealth do work, um, but that that is not a requirement for you. So that's the way that I, those are the terms I tend to use when I talk about class. And so when I talk about poor and working people, I'm actually talking about the majority of folks in the United States. So tell me a little bit, explain the, the idea of the digital poor house. Like what, what, did, what do you mean by that? What, what are these algorithms and other automated systems? How, how are they creating this digital poor house? Yes. Yeah, so we have a tendency to talk about technology like it's like the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey, right? Like it comes from nowhere, it lands and it changes everything. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about in the book is how, particularly in social assistance, that the technologies we're seeing are more evolution than revolution. Um, and what that required is uh, this this metaphor, I think, of uh, the digital poorhouse. So poorhouses were these brick and mortar institutions um, that were intended to incarcerate the poor. Um, we, uh, around the 1820s, we um, decided that this was our sort of first and foremost approach to poverty reduction was to make the conditions of receiving public aid so um, horrible, so horrifying um, that no one would reach out for public aid unless they were absolutely, absolutely, absolutely desperate. So the idea was to build these institutions, one in every county in the United States. We never made it quite to one in every county, but there were well more than a thousand of them across the United States incarcerating probably hundreds of thousands of people. Um, And uh, it, it was no small choice to enter the poorhouse. So if you were white and male and you had these rights, again, this is 1820, you had to give up your right to vote, your right to marry, um, your right to hold office. Uh, You were generally separated from your children as a condition of entering the poorhouse because it was thought by progressive reformers at the time that poor children could um, be sort of recuperated or rehabilitated by having access to middle class, professional middle class families. Um, And by access that generally meant like working for them um, for free as servants or agricultural labor. Um, And some of these poor houses had death rates as high as um, 30% annually, meaning like a third of people who entered these places died every year. Um, So it was no small choice to enter a poor house. Um, And the reason I use the metaphor is that the decision to build these county poor houses really marks a really important moral moment in the United States. And it's the moment that we decide that our social assistance systems should act more like moral thermometers deciding whether or not you're deserving enough of help, moral enough, um, good enough for help, rather than public services being universal floors under us all, rather than making the decision that says there is a line under which we don't let anyone go for any reason. And I believe that's really the sort of deep social programming that I saw structuring today's high tech tools, the um, the ones that I reported on in, in the book. So in a lot of ways, this isn't really a new problem is what you're saying. And it's not really that technology is not the problem, right? It's we're the problem. (laughs) Like we don't know what to do with the poor. We're afraid of the poor. We want to storehouse them somewhere so we don't have to look at it, look at them. I mean, is that, is that an accurate description? 
Well, I'd say I'm a person who doesn't believe that, uh, you know, technology lands and changes the world on its own. Um, I'm also not a person who believes that, uh, you know, technology just does whatever we tell it to do, right? Mm-hmm. That sort of guns don't kill people, people kill people argument. Um, I believe they're like densely caught up in each other, that we build the tools that we think we need. Um, and we often bury really important political choices in them in ways that make those political choices invisible. So one of the things that's really important that I talk about in the book is that we often talk about the kinds of systems um, that I report on, like they're just administ- simple administrative upgrades, but they actually in in inside them are these really important political decisions that we should be talking about. Things like how do we deal with economic inequality? Things like how do we deal with the fact that capitalism doesn't find caregiving very useful um, or uh, or valuable in terms of the kind of money that people will will pay for it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say it's us because the tools are us, um, but the tools also matter. Like it's the digital poorhouse, I think, is a really good metaphor, but it only goes so far. The, what we're building now um, is quite different in, in some important ways. So what you talk about a lot is that a lot of these technologies are really removing the human, removing specifically human discretion from the problem. You you, ta- you went to several different places and looked at systems that uh, helped determine who was, uh, who, was uh, who could get welfare and also kids, uh, whether parents were most likely to abuse their kids. And um, what was the third? Uh, so the coordinated entry system in Los Angeles, the, yeah, the, uh, the match, match.com of uh, homelessness. Yeah, that's what they call it. And so what you found was in many, in all the, these cases, the human social workers were often removed from the system and replaced by an algorithm that, algorithm that would make these decisions? So um, that's the case mostly in the Indiana um, case that I talk about. So in in Indiana, I write about this attempt to automate and privatize all of the eligibility processes for the welfare system. So that's the cash assistance, TANF, uh, Medicaid, healthcare, um, and uh, what was called at the time food stamps is now called SNAP. Um, So in 2006, the then governor, um, Mitch Daniels, signed this $1.34 billion contract with a consortium of high-tech companies. So IBM, Um, and ACS and several other companies um, to basically move um, 1,500 uh, social caseworkers who used to work in in local county offices to these regionalized, privatized call centers that were run by ACS. Um, And what that looked like from the caseworkers' point of view, um, if they managed to keep their job, because the jobs often moved hundreds of miles from where they were living. Um, So if they managed to keep their jobs and transition into the um, call center, they were no longer responsible for a caseload of families who they were you know, saw through the process from application to benefit, um, but rather they reacted to um, a list of tasks that dropped into their workflow management system in this sort of new computerized system. So one of the things that really changed for them was that um, they were no longer accountable. No one was really in, on the, on the, on uh, computer company side was accountable for correct decisions. So the contract had a lot, had a lot of um, benchmarks in it, which were things like how quickly can you answer the call? How much fraud can you find? Um, but there was no benchmark for our people who are eligible for assistance, getting all the assistance that they're eligible for. Um, and the results of that were, I don't, I think pretty predictable, which is the system denied a million applications for public assistance in the first three years of the experiment, a 54% increase from the three years before the experiment. Um, they all the most of the folks were denied for a sort of catch-all reason that was failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility, uh, which basically just meant that someone somewhere had made a mistake. Like the applicant could have forgotten to sign page 34 of a 50-page application, or they could have um, photocopied their driver's license and then. Uh, faxed it to the document processing center who then scanned it and all they got was like a black box um, instead of the driver's, the picture of the driver's license um, or somebody in a call center made a mistake and that happened all the time. Um, so sort of no matter what 
which kind of error it was, the applicant just got a letter that said you failed to cooperate in establishing eligibility and you're denied or you're kicked off benefits that you're already on. And it it shifted the burden of figuring out what had gone wrong from the, the shoulders of the state and the counties to some of the most vulnerable people in the state of Indiana. So folks who are applying for public assistance and some folks, you know, managed to soldier through and figure it out. Like the the family I, I spoke, one of the families I spoke to there, um, they're the, the family of Sophie Stipes. Um, but for every family who managed to figure out what had gone wrong and corrected in the incredibly short amount of time that they had to do that, um, there were likely nine families who, who didn't. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're heartbreaking stories um, that you tell here. So is it, um, the, the, did it, is there any sense that we did, that they, they were able to catch fraud? Like, was there, were there any numbers of like, yes, these people were trying to fraud the system? Is there any percentage that you know of that were caught with these systems? Yeah, so, uh, so fraud and, uh, and, and, Fighting fraud and increasing efficiency and saving money tend to be the the basic values that underlie these systems, and those are good. Those are part of a set of values that we should have, right? Um, that's th those are Im important goals for any system. Um, I will say that fraud and public assistance, at least from the applicants and recipient side, um, is is quite low. Um, the in food stamps or um, SNAP, it's now called. Um, it's something like three and a half percent. And it isn't even, that's not even fraud. That's just incorrect decisions, including fraud. Um, so the um, uh, incorrect uh, decisions, including fraud at the Department of Defense's travel department is something like 8%. Right. So we're definitely identifying a problem. It's kind of like voter red, voter fraud. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we're identifying a problem and raising barriers to folks who are legitimately trying to get into a system that they have a legal right to. Um, and you and often using the excuse of finding fraud to create barriers that are so hard to surmount that people who are eligible for services or further rights of citizenship like voting don't end up claiming those. Um, and, and so I talked to a really smart guy in Indiana, uh, Chris Holly, who was a Medicaid attorney, uh, and I think he really said it best. Um, so he said, you know, in our legal system, um, at least philosophically, the idea is uh, we'd rather 10 guilty people go free than one innocent person stay in jail. Again, that's a philosophical, we're not actually there. Um, he said this uh, system in Indiana really turned that on its head, that the idea was it was better for 10 eligible people to be denied the benefits they needed to keep themselves safe and healthy rather than um, one ineligible person get them. And I think that should give, give us a deep pause about who, who we are as a people and a culture that we find that acceptable and that will build systems to enforce that. Well, were these systems able to to prove that there isn't that much fraud? Like I mean, you you talk about uh, Reagan's stump speech, which I now I had totally forgotten about, but it was something definitely a part of my childhood where she talked to, he talked about the welfare queen, um, right. and he said that she had eighty different names and you know made one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year off of welfare. And you say really she had three she had three aliases or four aliases, and really only made eight thousand dollars or something something very small like the numbers were not accurate he was um yeah. exaggerating um are the is the technology able to say you know what like there is a very small amount of people or is it not designed to do that well that's a really interesting question it would be interesting to see um see a system that was intentionally um built not only to make sure that people got everything that they were legally entitled to, um, but that, uh, yeah, yeah, kept really good track of, um, you know, how many fraud investigations were launching and how successful they are. So uh, the best statistic I know on that is there were like uh, three quarters of a million uh, fraud investigations and in, in public services. I'm not sure which year, it might be 2015, uh, and that 55% of them found no fraud at all. And one of the things I'd like to know as a reporter is actually what, like what percentage of those cases turned up, you know, like more than even $100 worth of, uh, uh, of fraud. Um, because clearly the investigations, if they're not, if they're half fall, like half half not correct, right? Half wrong and are only turning up a small amount of fraud, then um, 
why are we paying for them? Because they're clearly costing more than $100 per investigation, right? So I don't know the answer to that. That's something I'd be really interested to learn more about if somebody out there knows those figures. Um, find me at virginia-ubanks.com and <laughs> let me know because <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know that. Yeah, I mean, so so the, the failure to cooperate, that's the letter that people got to put the onus yeah. on them to, uh, to, to figure out. And, you know, we, uh, all of us, I'm sure everyone listening to this have had that experience of some mistaken paperwork and you're dealing with bureaucracy and you have to spend all day on the phone or hours, what seems like all day. And you you, I mean, you talked yourself about one of the things that about your job that's different is the discretionary time. And you have a story about what happened to you with insurance um, as well. And you, and you were, admit that it's lucky to have that time to be able to figure out the problem. And so, yeah, so, so many people don't have that time. So, so what happens, tell, tell us a little bit about what happens when they get that failure to cooperate and they have three jobs and four kids and they can't spend the time that we maybe could. Yeah, something that's really, I think, interesting uh, and also very troubling about my reporting on the Indiana case is that I spoke mostly to folks who had had good outcomes, right? So there are people who identified themselves because they had sort of gone on record um, as there had been a mistake about their case and they had fought back and they had won. So, for example, I talk, um, I talked at great length to the family of Sophie Stipes, who is a, at the time that this rolled out, was a, a six-year-old girl. Um, she's deeply disabled. She's cerebral palsy and, and a number of other health um, struggles. Um, and she received, Sophie, the six-year-old, um, received directly from the state a letter saying that she had failed to cooperate in establishing eligibility and that she would be kicked off Medicaid um, if they, uh, if her family couldn't um, solve the, the problem in something like three days um, by the time they got the letter. Um, and they sort of leapt into action um, Kim and Kevin Stipes, her parents, uh, who are very smart, very um, um, strong, generous, brave people. Um, and they actually, with the help of some folks from um, a, a senior organization in the area, um, took Sophie to the state house um, to, to sort of ask um, with TV cameras in tow uh, why uh, the state was kicking a six-year-old girl in a wheelchair off of her Medicaid. Um, so they ended up having a, a, a good outcome. Um, I also talk about, um, I, I spoke at length to Lindsay Kidwell, um, who was thrown off her Medicaid during the experiment um, right after the birth of her first son and just a week or two after Christmas. Um, and um, one of the things that was really interesting about her story is that um, she... Um, asked for uh, what is her her right um, to fair process, um, which is there to due process. There's a thing called a fair hearing, um, which you can ask for. Uh, it's an administrative law procedure that happens in front of a a sort of administrative law judge um, where you think public assistance has made a mistake in how they've made uh, an eligibility determination in your case. Um, and basically you're allowed to go in and present evidence and the state has to pre present evidence um, that they're correct. Um, and then the administrative law judge makes a decision. And um, the reality is almost all fair hearings that go to the go in front of an administrative law judge um, turn out in favor of the um, recipient, the applicant, the claimant. So Lindsay Kidwell, um, after being told several times that she wasn't in fact eligible for Medicaid, um, asked for a fair hearing. Um, a couple of weeks later, she got a phone call from the call center and the gentleman she spoke to said, uh, I'm looking in the computer right now. I'm seeing exactly what the judge is gonna see. Um, it says you didn't give us the information we needed. Um, so the judge is gonna see this and deny you. So you should cancel your fair hearing right now. So he basically pressured her to cancel her fair hearing. She refused to do that. Um, and that's partially because she had an advocate who um, gave her advice um, that said, you know, don't let them strong arm you into taking away your rights. Um, and she kept at it with her fair hearing. She went into her fair hearing. The judge looked at the computer, was like, they've clearly made a mistake. Um, you've always been eligible. Um, everything's good. You know, go home. You're fine. Um, so one of the things that's... Uh, 
pro- really deeply troubling um, about the stories I tell in the book is these are actually some of the best stories of um, this case. And there's probably um, dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of cases where things turned out much worse for folks. Um, and Kevin Stipe said that about his wife. He said, you know, my wife is really smart and really thorough um, and it should have been a snap for her to get this stuff in correctly. And I know that if she couldn't do it, that there are thousands of people out there who couldn't do it um, because they are much more vulnerable than um, Kim Kim and Kevin were. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Ring is working to make neighborhoods safer with their doorbell that you can see and talk to anyone, whether you're inside the house or you're at work or you're down the street or you're in another country, you can still talk to someone who's coming to your door and tell them, hey, get away from that or just leave that there or or, I'm not home, go in and feed the dog. I forgot about him. Don't do that. Don't forget to feed your dog. Ring's mission, like I said, is to make neighborhoods safer and uh, you can speak to intruders if you want on your smartphone. They also have the floodlight and the spotlight cam, and that lets you build a ring of security around your entire property. The floodlight cam is motion activated, and the floodlight connects to your phone so that you can see and everything can light up if you need it, if it's nighttime or dark. With high visibility floodlights, it also has HD video and two-way audio, so they could talk back to you. They're just like, oh, I saw saw your cat. I'm gonna return them to you, and you say, thanks. It lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. You can talk to the visitors. You can set off an alarm if you think someone is suspicious. And you can do that right from your phone. When things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is. Ring floodlight cams offer the ultimate in home security. Thieves just can't hide with Ring. What you can do if you don't trust me yet and you're not convinced yet, go to Ring's Twitter feed. That's where you can see clips of the Ring doorbell in action. And you can see some amazing videos, not just of criminals, but of uh, a tall tale that proved out to be true. This one you're watching right here, a neighbor said that a goat chased him home and uh, they didn't believe him. Who believes that a goat would chase you? But uh, you can see it all on the Ring video cam. So um, yeah, don't be making up stories because you're gonna get caught. Uh, And goats are really dangerous. They're vicious creatures. So you can monitor every corner of your property with the Ring video doorbell, the Ring security kit. It can include two flood cams or three flood cams, whatever you need to cover your whole property. And you connect your Ring video doorbell. They work all together. It's so nice. I've been doing so much smart home stuff and it's so nice when things work together, when they're made to work together. And Ring really makes everything uh, work together, which is amazing. Uh, My parents have Ring and it's so great. Um, Even though I'm an adult, I still like to have parties at their house when uh, they go out of town. But this time they can see me go in and out and say, hi, Megan, hope your friends are having a a good time, that sort of thing. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Save up to $150 on a Ring of Security kit at ring.com slash triangulation. That's ring.com slash triangulation. And you can save up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. Ring.com slash triangulation. We thank them for their support of this show. One of the, the one of the interesting places you went to, you were, were looking into an algorithm that decides whether or not um, parents are likely to, or children will find themselves in an abusive situation, and uh, it reminds it reminded me of the of when um, you know we would see an unhoused person on the street, and my kids when they were younger, and they would say things like, oh, like they're you know if we give them money, they'll buy alcohol, and you know that idea that like people that don't have homes are um, more likely to be alcoholics when you know we live in Sonoma County, we live in wine country and there's lots of people in mansions that are also alcoholics yeah. they just have a house around them so that yeah. made me think of uh of this that it's it's like there's they're not only unhoused but they have they don't have those protections uh pri- i mean privacy really is a privilege that is getting more and more just uh for rich people 
Mm. Yeah, so there's a terrific book about that by uh, an incredible scholar named Kiara Bridges. Um, it's called The Poverty of Privacy, I believe. Um, and I just, everybody should immediately read it because she's uh, just way more on point about that stuff than I am. One of the things that I think is really interesting is for most of the folks I spoke to, uh, like privacy isn't the first thing they go to as something they want. That doesn't mean they don't want it. It just means that like in their lives, there's not a huge expectation of privacy, right? Either they live in very dense urban neighborhoods or they're inside the public service system where unfortunately the assumption is that you trade away your right to privacy for your right to, you know, housing or food. Um, you know, I think we should live in a, in a culture that doesn't require you to trade any of your human rights for your other human rights. Um, but they, they often live in places where that's an expectation. So privacy is not necessarily the first thing or even in the first six things um, that people are really concerned about. Like they tend to be, at least in my research and my reporting, folks tended to be concerned about things like self-determination, like their ability to make decisions for themselves um, and dignity um, and, and living full lives and, and protecting their kids and, and privacy wasn't sort of in the in the top in the top couple of things that they were interested in um, but I think you make a really good point um, both about these systems that are aimed at the unhoused like the coordinated entry system I talk about in Los Angeles and about the system that I talk about in Allegheny County which is called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool the AFST and it's actually really important to note because um, often when people write about this tool they they make exactly the sort of slip that that you just made that the tool does doesn't actually predict um, child maltreatment. It actually predicts which children will continue to be involved in the child welfare system. And those are two really different things. Mm -hmm. um, so the designers of the model still think that's useful for keeping children from harm. Um, I'd say that the parents, um, like the folks I, some of the folks I spoke to, um, had concerns that that's actually, that whether or not that's a good assumption that um, involvement in the child welfare system and harm are actually close enough proxies that they can be used in the way that the model's using them. Um, so you want me to talk a little bit about the Allegheny Family Screen? Yeah, tool? I mean, so, so basically what you're saying no. is that the idea is the algorithm is intended to keep get people out of the system, whether for their own good or for, so to save money. Yeah, so, okay, so this is where the Indiana eligibility system and the Allegheny family screening tool sort of part ways. Um, so, and it's actually really important to say, I don't think I made this clear enough in the book, um, that, um, that maybe the, the Indiana case is a, is a kind of a story that we're pretty familiar with and comfortable with already, even though we see it as a bad story, which is the story of, uh, right, a politician sort of on a mission that it doesn't work out well for poor and working people, um, a, a corporation that steps into that space and says like, yeah, you know, we're happy to take a one and a half billion dollar contract to kick people off of, off of public assistance um, and sort of ongoing corruption and incompetence that just makes the, the, the case worse and worse and worse. So Indiana is the closest I can get to, um, you know, I don't know what was in Governor Mitch Daniels' heart, but that's the closest case we can get to to saying there there might have been some bad intentions there. Um, you know, if they had intended to build a system that worked better at um, denying people access to their to their rights, um, I, I'm not sure they could have built one intentionally that worked any better than the one they got. But in the second two um, cases that I talk about, the coordinated entry system in Los Angeles and the Allegheny Family Screening Tool near um, Pittsburgh in the county where Pittsburgh is, um, all of the designers, the administrators, um, the caseworkers, the folks I spoke to on the state and county side had incredibly good intentions, were very smart people and cared deeply about the lives and the safety and the health of the people their agencies served. And I really did that intentionally because it's easy to write a super scary book of the worst cases you can find. But I thought it was more interesting to write a book that said, these are some of the best systems we have and they're still raising these really important concerns for the families that they're aimed at. And that actually says something really 
deep about us and about the way we use technology to avoid making really hard decisions um, about who we are as a culture and, and as a people. So that's really important, I think, to understand is that those second two cases um, are really some very smart, well-intentioned people doing the best they can. Um, but the tools they're building, um, I think, are, are um, vulnerable to automating uh, inequality. So one of those is this tool, the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. And what it is is a statistical model that's supposed to be able to predict um, which children will continue to be involved with the um, child welfare system um, in a way that they believe indicates that those children will be harmed in the future. Um, and from the point of view of families, um, they're really concerned about false negatives. I'm sorry, false positives in that system. That, that just means that um, the system is seeing harm where none might actually exist. Um, and there's good reason for them to be concerned about that um, because this tool is built on um, on top of a data warehouse that has a billion records about folks in Allegheny County that are collected, sort of data extracts that are collected regularly, um, really only from programs who serve poor and working people. Um, families have a real... Um, feeling that they are being over surveilled and targeted um, because they reach out for support um, to public programs. So professional middle class families, you know, reach out for the same amount of support, but because they're paying for it out of pocket or with private insurance, they don't end up in this data warehouse, which means they don't end up being risk rated by this model, which means they're not being identified as risks to their children. Um, and so the many of the families that I spoke to said they felt like the tool confuses parenting while poor with poor parenting um, and that they felt like it was a feedback loop that would drive more surveillance of their communities and then um, more and more in, um uh, involvement with the, the child welfare system, which they um, find both useful, a useful source of resources and a really frightening place where you have to give the state the right to take your children away from you. Um, so it's quite different than Indiana, right? Indiana was very much about diversion and Allegheny family, the Allegheny family screening tool for the families who are its targets, at least, feels like um, being included in a system that you don't necessarily want to be included in. Now, is that something that you see changing and uh, not being just for the poor, like the, the Dorothy's um, assumption that they were coming for us? Is that something, Do you have you seen that increasing, that sort of surveillance of, of our daily lives? Well, I mean, I think the way that it mostly affects professional middle class folks who are not um, you know, white middle, middle class folks folks um, is uh, through consumer surveillance, right? Surveillance through things like Facebook or social media or your uh, your Echo or whatever the, the things are, Alexa or whatever you, you have in your house. And there's, re there's real reason to be concerned about that. Um, but again, the lesson from Dorothy is like, if you're scared about it happening in your professional middle class home, like guaranteed it's happening in a much more intense way in a poor and working class home. Um, so, Right. For example, the child welfare system is just a system that professional middle class people kind of never come into contact with and don't really understand the inside of at all. Um, so one of the things that was hardest about writing the book was not just that it's um, it can be hard to explain things like statistical models in ways that are interesting and engaging. Um, also, for the part of my audience that is professional middle class, it felt really important to help them understand what a system like the child welfare system feels like from the inside. Um, because otherwise we end up in the in this very t much too simple story that says, right, the only harm that happens around the child welfare system is the harm to children um, that uh, is due to their caretakers. And that happens and it's really important to be real about that. Like caretakers sometimes do horrible things to the kids in their care. But 
But there are other harms in the child welfare system, including the harm of an investigation, um, which can create so much stress for a family that you can actually create the kind of maltreatment that you're hoping to prevent. And of course, the harm of, of um, separation, um, separating children from, um, from their caregivers, which can be incredibly traumatic for, for children and caregivers both. So we see these kinds of stories being written about tools like the Allegheny Family Screening Tool that, that basically say, like, well, where's the harm? Like, if, if it's a false positive, well, it's good that we had eyes on this kid anyway. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable saying that most parents who have been the subject of one of these investigations would not agree that no harm occurs through, um, in the process of an investigation. So, so all of this technology was, was supposed to make things more efficient, save money, um, or eventually lead to a reduction in costs. And you say that that the that right now real assistance is much more expensive than this technology um, can provide. So, what is that? I mean, is there is there something we can do? Is there a, is there a, a good future? Give me some good news, Virginia. Yeah, so it's actually, so I'll give you good news, but but I'm going to take this cost. Um, I'm, it's, I'm really interested in this cost question, actually, because I'm, I'm actually looking at another historical moment right now. I've been um, trying to write about the, there was a movement in the United States in the late 1870s called scientific charity. And scientific charity used much the same language that we hear now about evidence-based um, uh, social services or evidence-based um, philanthropy. Um, and it's so that there's like a really striking similarity to the way these things moved out. So scientific charity was supposed to be a way to increase efficiency, to care for people um, uh, with more compassion um, uh, and to um, reduce the number of what they called at the time paupers. Um, and it was supposed to do it all with less money um, and uh, less state uh, intervention. So it was supposed to be mostly private, mostly voluntary. Um, and this sounds very sort of familiar to me um, in the, you know, sort of the age of new public management, this idea that data-based um, interventions, evidence-based interventions sort of are naturally uh, create efficiencies. Um, and it, the thing that's really interesting about scientific charity is they ended up uh, helping fewer people for a lot more money. Um, and so I'm actually really interested in this question. Turns out to be a really hard question to answer of whether we're paying more or less when we use these high tech tools than we would if we just had like a universal basic income, um, right? Where you're not making these moral judgments about so whether somebody's worthy enough for assistance or not. You're just saying, hey, as a culture, there's a line below which nobody is allowed to go. Like nobody lives in a tent on the sidewalk like, um, you know, 50,000 people in Los Angeles County do. Like nobody uh, loses, no parent loses their child because they can't afford medication, right? Or or, um, yeah, no family goes without food or health care. Um, so those are decisions we can make as, as a community. I'm not convinced that those making that decision is any um, more expensive than the kind of um, – anti-fraud, pro-efficiency arms race we have um, going on right now. But the changes it will require in us as a people are not, well, not necessarily more expensive, a lot deeper, right? So it, this move from um, moral judgment to universal floors is a move that for some reason the United States really alone among developed countries is just not willing um, to make. And so I believe that has everything to do, at least in part, um, with the history of race and white supremacy in the United States, that part of um, the ideology behind seeing the poor as somehow particularly pathological um, has everything to do with not wanting um, to extend and support to families of color. Um, I think that that's a big part of the story. Um, though I will say that uh, we have a long history of hating poor people of every color in this country, um, but uh, certainly race is a, is a big part of it. So these moves that we have to make are really deep moves. Um, the thing that the optimistic stuff is um, that I believe we're in the middle of that moment right now. So this summer is the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign on Washington, D.C. 
Tennessee, led by the Southern Christian Leadership Coalition and Martin Luther King before his assassination. Um, we've seen all this incredible upswelling of activism and resistance and cultural work by organizations that are led by poor and working people. I'm really excited about that moment. Um, and I really think that that at at heart of the question is what we what we really need to do, right? We need to start telling better stories about poverty in the United States, more true stories about poverty in the United States. Because the reality is, even though we tell ourselves this story that poverty is somehow an aberration in this country, it actually is the majority experience. So 51% of us will be below the poverty line at some point in our adult lives. So between 20 and 64 um, and a full uh, two thirds of us will access means tested public assistance. And that means like straight welfare. That's not social security. That's not reduced price school lunches. That's straight welfare. Um, so though your vulnerability to poverty is influenced by all kinds of things, whether or not you're born poor, or whether or not you're a person of color, whether or not you have legal status, uh, whether or not you have a disability or mental health issues. Um, the fact is that poverty is a majority issue and we don't talk about it as if it's a, if it, as if it happens to potentially everyone. We talk about it as if it only happens to folks who are maybe pathological. Um, and those are the stories that we absolutely have to change. We can't get to that until we sort of share the truth of our own experience. Um, sort of bringing it back to our conversation about sort of talking about class that we had at the beginning of the of the conversation like we don't get to better politics or to better tech before we share better stories right so ironically maybe the solution to bad data is actually better stories <laughs> That I mean, so the universal basic income, you bring that up and I think uh, I, I don't want to let that go because a lot of the um, upswelling comes from Silicon Valley about. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so what do you make of this, um, you know, mostly liberal, libertarian, very liberal um, community saying, yeah, let's I support uh, universal basic income. Yeah, so UBI, uh, so people call them UBIs. Um, uh, so universal ba basic incomes, I think, really fascinating and really complicated. Um, so it's really important to remember that the United States almost passed a universal basic income. Um, and interestingly enough, um, it was under uh, the presidency of Richard Nixon, right? So Nixon was a big fan of the universal basic income. He had a plan called the uh, Family Assistance Plan, the FAP. And... Um, one of the reasons uh, that it failed was that not only was it not super um, popular with conservatives, um, but it also um, failed to meet sort of the basic standards of justice that um, uh, folks who were organizing for universal incomes from poor and working class communities at the time, like the National Welfare Rights Organization, were asking for. So they had um, a competing plan uh, that um, was a, a much more generous uh, universal basic income, but also most importantly, it didn't do away with other programs. So I think if we were gonna have a UBI, like fantastic, uh, I think it's a great place to start, but only if it doesn't then, you know, basically do away with the whole social, um, the whole social welfare state, right? Like saying like, here's your $8,000, good luck out there, um, is not what I'm talking about, right? But what I do say in the book is not that a UBI would solve poverty. I'm actually not convinced it would do that, um, particularly in our political culture, um, but that it would solve many of the problems of the digital poorhouse, which is this constant need to try to decide whether people's poverty is their own fault before we can help them, right? The idea is to um, create a basic floor under anyone below which no one is allowed to go. And to me, that's a basic universal human rights approach. And that's part of where we need to be moving. Um, but yeah, the universal basic incomes, the devil's def definitely in the details. <laughs> this episode of Triangulation is brought to you by FreshBooks. If you run your own business, you want to be busy running the business, not doing the books. That's why FreshBooks is great. So you can focus on what you want to do and let them do all the numbers stuff. FreshBooks, streamline your business operations with FreshBooks, the easy to use 
cloud accounting software. We've said it before, it is ridiculously easy to use. Anyone can use it and it's built specifically for you, the small business owner. Quickly access accounting reports in FreshBooks on their dashboard and you can send professional looking invoices in seconds. So no more little templates that everyone else uses. Yours can look really professional and it comes from FreshBooks. Keep tabs on your business no matter where you are with the FreshBooks mobile app for Android or iOS. So go to Hawaii, take a vacation and you can figure out what everything is doing in your app. FreshBooks automatically connects to your bank account and updates expenses daily. Import expenses in bulk or take a picture of a receipt, upload it and let FreshBooks do the rest. It is really hard to run your own business. I am so impressed with anyone who goes out on their own and works for themselves and I want it to be easy. So I want you to try to try FreshBooks. If this is what you're doing, you can manage team member rates and add team members as business partner, basic employee or con contractor. You can create proposals and they can have rich text content and images. You can also request your client's e-signature as they accept your proposal. You can also use revenue streams graph. This is new to know exactly where your invoice and non-invoice revenue, that's online sales and ads, is coming from so you can accurately plan for growth and make informed decisions about how to diversify. You can easily import clients from a CSV file with just a few clicks. The new Microsoft Outlook payments integration into FreshBooks allows users to view and pay FreshBook invoices regardless of what device they came from. If your credit card is registered with Outlook Payments. It works with that too. It just pay with one click. Join the 24 million people who've used FreshBooks to painlessly send invoices, track time, and capture expenses, and then get back to doing what you love, to running your business, for doing it on your own. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation and enter triangulation in the how did you hear about us section. That's freshbooks.com slash triangulation. And we thank FreshBooks for their support of this show. So uh, you have a written on your blog about the a Hippocratic Oath for big data designers. It's also in your book. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what kind of questions you want people to ask themselves before they uh, create these tools. Yeah, so one of the things that's been really interesting about touring behind the book for the last six months um, is that I now believe that you should have to tour your book for six months before you write your book. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's actually some things that I'm just much clearer on than I was um, when I wrote the book, but partially just from having conversations like this and having conversations with audiences and people who have read the book. Um, and one of the, interestingly, one of those um, self, one of that, those, those points of self-awareness is that I um, believed, particularly in my solutions chapter and chapters at the end of the book, that I was primarily speaking to um, data scientists and analytics folks and policymakers. Um, and what I've come to understand is where I'm most useful is talking to um, organizations and people on the ground who are facing the sort of coming of one of these tools um, and is really helping them understand what kinds of questions they should be asking um, in order to get the best possible outcomes. So that's a big shift for me. Um, so I'm actually much less interested in the Hippocratic Oath than I was when I finished the book. I will say that the oath sort of boils down to two basic questions questions that data scientists and designers should ask themselves. One is, does the tool increase um, the dignity and the self-determination of poor and working people? The second is, if this tool was aimed at anyone but poor and working people, uh, would it be tolerated? And if the question to either one of those is no, then like, then no, you're doing something wrong. You're on the wrong side of history. Don't do it. Um, what I'd say now is that I feel like in certain conditions, um, analytics and predictive algorithms and modeling can be incredibly useful, um, but those are conditions that are sort of rarely met right now. Um, so one of the conditions for me on using this stuff well is that you use it in the context of increased resources rather than less resources, rather than trying to make things more efficient uh, and more cost effective, that you use um, algorithmic tools or predictive tools to make the best 
um, decisions around vastly increased resources. So example of that would be sort of Georgia State is using this new tool, this new set of um, predictive analytics based tools um, to try to um, stop uh, losing students um, to what is a, a traditionally historically black um, college in, in Georgia. Um, and so they had a new president who came in talking about pr the use of predictive analytics in advising to help identify students who are struggling earlier and to keep them in school and ke keep them graduating within six years. And they've had remarkable success doing this. And one of the things that's really interesting about it is it gets reported by, as a like success of predictive analytics story. What, do, what the, the lead that I think gets buried every time people talk about this is at the same time that they were rolling out predictive analytics, they went from doing 1,000 advising appointments a year to doing 52,000 advising appointments a year. So it actually is a story of predictive analytics helping use the vastly increased resources they needed to actually tackle the problem, right? Um, so, but it doesn't, get, it, it doesn't get reported in that way. And I find that really interesting. So there's all sorts of conditions that I think need to be there. Like, are you increasing re, uh, resources? Are you using good analytics, right? Like, is your validation data non-discriminatory? Are your outcome variables good or are they proxies that don't work, right? Are your predictive variables, um, are they fueling disproportionality? Uh, like, are you making a model that's self-fulfilling that creates the very outcomes that it says it's predicting? Um, I think we need to be collecting data in ways that are non-coercive, that you're not forcing people to like trade their data for a, a better, a higher lottery number to uh, housing resources, for example, and that that data is then secure. So there's huge issues with um, identity theft, particularly in unhoused communities, um, that these tools don't increase stigma that they can be stopped, right? Like we don't want to like get a tool rolling that we then can't meaningfully say, oh, hang on, this is not having the results we want, like stop. Um, and that there are remedies for people who have been harmed by these tools when they go wrong. Um, and that's certainly something that um, I've, I've heard very little conversation about. Like what is your, what are your rights if you are incorrectly identified, right? As someone who might create, um, might commit a violent crime in the future or who might harm their ch their children and then end up in a child welfare investigation, right? Like what are, what are your rights to, to seek re remedy and redress? Um, so I think all of those conversations are conversations we need to be having. Um, and I'm really excited to be just one voice in um, this like real sea of um, really interesting conversation about the challenges that these tools um, pose to us as a political community and as people who are supposed to care for each other. Well, Virginia, thank you so much for joining us. I think if anyone enjoyed this conversation and they are in this field or they're, they know someone who's a policymaker or works at any of these organizations, get this into their hands, automating inequality, how high tech tools profile police and punish the poor. And Virginia, Dr. Virginia Eubanks, thank you so much. You can find her at virginia-eubanks.com. And you're also on Twitter and um, you can find all that information at your website. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It was a great conversation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Triangulation. Triangulation records every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific. And you can watch live at twit.tv slash live, or you can download it from wherever you get your podcasts. You can watch it. You can listen to it. You can watch it on YouTube. You can comment. You can always email me. I'm Megan at twit.tv. And make sure to subscribe to the show. Go to twit.tv slash try. And then you don't have to go and get it at all. It comes to you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching Triangulation. Triangulation.